Hello and welcome to the first of a series of tutorial videos explaining how to make your own visual novel using the RNP Visual Novel Engine. First things first, what is a visual novel? A visual novel is a very special but simple kind of game where the protagonist goes through a story by making choices and following the narrative. Sometimes it is very simple with just dialogue, a few images and characters and a short storyline. But others are sprawling epics with multiple branching storylines or even additional modes of gameplay, such as battle mechanics from role-playing games or puzzles from adventure games. But don't worry about that. A good visual novel can focus heavily on the narrative, and words are cheap, with a little aid from image and audio to result in a very compelling and enjoyable game to play. In this series of tutorials, we're going to do exactly that. So what is Renpy then? An ingenious little piece of software that you can use to make your own visual novels without needing to do any coding or programming. Or almost any coding or programming. What we will do is scripting mostly, which is a very simple kind of programming to create our games. Don't worry, it's actually extremely easy to learn and use. With RenP, not only can you test your game while it's being made to change and improve it as you go, but also you can simply create the final game to distribute to your friends and the internet at large with nothing but the click of a button or three. You can make a game that can be played on a computer, a Mac, even an Android phone or online. Did I mention that RenP is absolutely free and open source? For any kind of use including commercial and non-commercial alike? Now that you're sold, let's start our journey to discover RenP. So, the first step is installing RenP. To do that, you will go to RenP's webpage, renp.org, and you will click on the download at the bar on top. Or you can click directly at the green button that says Download RenP 8.0.3, which is the latest version as of this video. Either way, you should try to download the latest stable version to make sure you get all the updates, bug fixes, and goodies that come with new versions. Both options will take you to the download page, which has several options to choose from, depending on your device and operating system. If you are using Windows, you will need to fi the file that ends in EXE. If you are using Mac, the one that says DMG. And if you are using Linux, you'll need the tar.bz2 file. There is even an ARM distribution for Raspberry users, which should come as a pleasant surprise to people working with this machine. You should click on the download link to start downloading and then we can go to the downloads when it is ready. Once the download is finished, you should go to your downloads and simply extract the file. In the case of Windows, it's a self-extractable that you can simply double click on and press extract. Wait a little bit and then it will create the folder. You don't actually need any further installation. As you can see, once you open the folder, there is a renp.exe that you can double click and it will start the launcher. This is the main interface for your own projects. To the left, you will see the tutorial and the question, which are two very standard projects that come with renp, so you can actually check code. And we also have Europe for Youth, which is the one we're going to be using to show the examples for these videos. Don't be afraid to check other people's codes. That's how most programmers do it until they have to actually write their own. To the right, you will see the name of, your, of the project saying Active Project. This shows you which one you actually have at the moment. Open Directory opens up any directory that is relevant to the game. Could be the images, could be the audio, so that you don't actually have to look around in the folders. And to the right, you will see edit file, which opens up the scripts where we have all of the coding. Script is the main one, where we will be writing most of the things that we need the game to do, and the rest are for more advanced features. We can open it up using script.rp, but it will ask us to use a text editor. You can use any one that you like, but it's best to use Atom, which is integrated with RenP. This will take a while, as it's going to download the necessary files. Once it has finished downloading and unpacking, it will notify that the update has been installed and you can click on proceed. This will actually open up Atom, so you can check the script. 
you can always put yes always so you make sure that it opens up for this way from now on but we will not be needing it for this video going back to the launcher we see several more actions that are quite more advanced but the most important that we will be checking later on is build distribution which is how you are going to actually make your game into something that can be played into other computers So we talked before about scripting languages and programming. The important thing to consider, Renpy's scripting language is really really easy and intuitive. It's almost like a set of keywords to make Renpy understand what you want it to do. For example, when you want to show an image in the middle of someone talking, all you have to do is write show and then the name of the image. Of course, you'll have to set up the image and assign it a name, but after that, it's that easy. You can even decide to put it on the left, the center, the right of the screen. All you have to do is put at right, for example, and it shows right. More on this on the video about images, but this is a very simple example. There is a lot more keywords like scene for backgrounds, play for music, or jump to move around the story. We'll explain those later on. Python, on the other hand, is a very popular programming language. This means that you can actually use Python for a lot more outside RMP. You can write very little useful programs or even make your own games using Python exactly the way you like them. Give or take some months of work, of course. Did you know that RMP is actually made using Python? Normally, we wouldn't really care all that much which language was used to make it, but in the case of RMP, it's actually a really handy fact to know. The reason this is important is that you can actually use Python code inside RMP allowing you to create more complicated stuff that RNP is not really able to handle on its own. You will notice the difference once you start making your own game between the RNP scripting language and actual Python, but they are very similar. For now, if you have to remember one thing, it's something called indentation. You will see that from one uh, keyword to another, sometimes there are four spaces. Yes, that is actually four presses of the spacebar button usually. This is called indentation and it's really important because that's how RMP understand what is inside where. But we will see that in a later video. We talked in the previous videos about keywords in RNP scripting language, and arguably the most important one is label. Label allows you to denote that whatever is inside it, remember the indentation, is part of one particular scene or chapter in your story. For RNP purposes, this is called a block. This organization will be crucial later on when you want to move from scene to scene, if for example the storyline branches on. After the keyword label, you should put the name of the scene as one word. If you need more than one word, you should put underscores, so that the computer is not confused, because it is expecting just one word. Also, some labels are important for NP, so you should be very careful when you use them. For example, label start is exactly where the game starts, so you should only have it in the beginning. Also, it's a very good idea, whenever you are giving a name to a label, that all names are unique, because if you are using the same name in see different places, the computer will literally be confused and will not allow you to play the game. Remember, computers are dumb and you should never be ambiguous when using them. Another strange thing you will notice is the hashtag before some of the sentences. In pro the programming parlance, this is called a comment. It is literally a comment to let people know, the ones that are reading the code, what exactly is happening. You should really not be afraid to use them because they're useful not only for you, when you come later to see a project and you've forgotten what's going on, but also for other people to understand what exactly you are writing in that particular piece of code. Then we can take a look at the text here. This is what actually shows up in the game as dialogue. Whenever we actually put something in quotes, then it shows up this line, is this line. And again, this line is this line. 
But this is just dialogue that for rent is the narrator. There is no name on top of it. What happens if we want to add a name? In that case, before every line, we need to add a, another pair of quotes and write the name. So for example, here voice will show up as a voice. But RNP makes games about dialogue, so it can be extremely tedious if we just keep writing the names again and again and again. Fortunately, RNP has us covered for that. In the beginning of the game, we can actually define specific recurring characters that we're going to use again and again. We're using the keyword define, followed by a very short name that we're going to have very little difficulty typing, hopefully. And then we're using the equal sign to call this, which is called a function. More on that later. Inside, we will need to write the name of the character so that it will show up like this. And we can even give it a different color if we want, because as you can see, this is slightly different than this. To assign a color, we just need to know the HTML format and just copy it properly, not forgetting the hashtag. After we've written a few more lines of code and dialogue, what we can actually write to finish the game is this command, return. And then we have a little game. Only text can be boring, so we will need images. To do that, we mostly use two keywords, scene and show. Scene sets up a new scene, clearing up all images present and presenting a new background, while show simply adds an image on top of the background, such as a character. In both cases, it's really important that the images are placed in the image directory and the names are clearly defined. No random string of numbers. Also, be careful of the format of the image file, that little ending after the full stop. For backgrounds, it should be JPG, JPEG, PNG or WebP. And for characters, it should be PNG or WebP. Also, note how these have more than one word in their names. This is because the first one is a tag and the other are attributes. For background scenes, all you need is the BG tag before the name, so BG Middle or BG School or BG Villa in this case. And BG is the tag, while the school or villa in this case is the attribute. For show, it's a bit more complicated. Again, the first word is the tag, so in this case, E for Y logo is the tag, and there is no attribute. But here we see that it says E for Y logo full. The reason that this exists is that there can be only one image with a specific tag, even if it has different attributes. So if this shows up and then we ask this to show, then actually this will disappear on its own. This is very useful when you have characters with different expressions or different costumes and appearances and you actually want them not to bother with hiding it every time. Speaking of which, there is also the hide keyword which hides an image. For example, it could be something like this. First, it appears with the show command, another image appears, but this one appears to the right actually, as we can see here. And then this transformed, why? Because here we put show e for y logo full, and this means that it actually takes this off and puts this on without us needing to hide it manually. Also, it is even possible, not only after disappearing, that you can do fancy stuff, like using this effect, which makes the screen go black and then go and show images again. And this you can do using transformations. The simplest one is this, called Dissolve. And you can even put one on top of the other, though that is not always a good idea, so you should be careful where you put each image. The usual uh, ways is left, right, and either center, like this, which starts from the bottom, or true center, 
which puts it exactly in the center of the screen. You should be careful with this, as I said, because it's very often a possibility that people forget and it creates a jumbled mess. While not strictly necessary, music and audio are great ways to enhance your game and the experience of your players. It's also quite simple to do. The keyword play music is used and then you add the name of the file just like in image files, except that you should add audio and slash before the name. Also, like image files, only specific kinds of files are supported. In our case, mp3 is easy and works just fine. This is an example of playing music. Welcome to the internet, have a look around. Anything that brain of yours can think of can be found. We've got mountains. There is a stop music keyword which stops right after this particular text. You can even also add fade in or fade out which creates a smoother transition like this. Welcome to the internet, have a look around. which takes values in seconds and you can also even use volume if you don't want every time to have the same volume for the music. Another thing to know about playing music is that actually music loops again and again so if you just want background music you don't have to put it again and again in the commands just once is fine. There's also cue music which we're not using here in case you want to have different songs playing one after the other in a queue. Sometimes you just want a much simpler sound to play, like a sound effect, in which case you use the play sound keyword, again with the audio slash and the name of the mp3 or other file you're using, which will show like this. Sounds, unlike music, will play only once. If we want them to keep playing, we need to put the loop keyword And they will keep playing again and again until we put stop sound, which we should because if it's annoying, it could be a problem for the players. There's also additional keywords that you can use, including, as we said, loop and no loop, if we just want the music to play once, for example. And there is also this, which is from which second to which second you want to play, in which case the song will appear and start playing at a specific time. Here's a side, here's a tip for straining pasta, here's a nine year and again we can stop the music. A little bit of extra things that you can do. You can even use different channels because one is music, the other is sound and the other is voice. But I think by now we're getting into much deeper territory and I will leave it up to you if you want to explore options about music and audio. A story game or visual novel is all about choices, so it's important to learn how exactly you can make these choices appear in the game. We will be using the keyword menu, as shown here, which is followed by a column. And then, very important, for the choices we need indentation. Four spaces and then we see the first choice. Inside quotes is the text that appears, like this. And then indentation after the colon, and it does what we want it to do. In this case, we're using a jump command. But what does the jump command do? First, we need to talk a bit about the control flow and RMP. When a RMP game starts, after doing what it needs to do in the beginning, what programmers call initialization, it looks for the label called start and starts from there. When the jump, what the jump keyword or statement, as they are called in RMP, does is that it looks for that particular label and goes directly there to continue. Think of it like a book which tells you to go to page 45, which is a pretty apt description of a visual novel after all. Of course, now it's quite obvious why you cannot have two labels with identical names. The poor game will be confused and it will not know where exactly to go. In this case, the first jump command sends us to the label YE. So it goes straight here. After this dialogue, 
it goes back to the label of the choice, which is actually back. So it goes straight here and it gives you the menu again, like this. So we can keep seeing back to the menu until we finally choose the last, which says to the end and it jumps here where it doesn't jump back. Another important thing to remember is that since you're going to be using a lot of labels, it is a very good idea to have meaningful names and not numbers or even worse random names because you will be quite confused when it comes to where the branches of the storyline are going. Another good practice that you can use is even if you don't intend to use jump between labels, instead of having very very long scenes with the labels, like this one for example, you should try breaking it down so that you can actually have more space and you should be less confused where everything is. One last thing, this is a very interesting example, here it says jump, nothing to see here, it will literally jump here and this dialogue will never show up in the game because the control flow literally jumps above it and keeps going. Well, now we've covered the basics, so you can actually create your first proper game, complete with dialogue, graphics, music, and even choices for where the story goes. And we can now test our game. All we have to do is go to the launcher, make sure our project is the active one, and then press launch project. Um, oops. Unless you've been very meticulous, in which case I'm impressed, you'll probably get a grey screen like this the first time. The good thing is that it tells you exactly what went wrong, to the best of its ability, of course, so you can fix it. The most important thing, arguably, is the line where the problem is, so you can check it. In this case, it is line 19, so we can go to the script, find li line 19, and see what the problem is. In this case, we have forgot the colon. So we add it, and we save the script, and we go back again to launch the project. So now it's playing just fine. Let's start. Everything goes normally until we get another grey screen. Now the game has crashed because it did not catch this error in the beginning. It caught it now that it went to it. And we can see that in line 42, there seems to be this text which creates a problem. This should be at. It's just a simple typo, but it happens all the time. So again, we have to go back, find line 42, correct the mistake, save the script, quit and launch the project again. Start and now it keeps playing just fine. So remember, if there is an error, all you have to do is find the line and look because 99% of the time it's probably just a typo or a simple mistake that you forgot a colon. Now we're getting into the deep end. One very important concept in programming and in logic generally actually is conditional statements, also known as ifs. An if is a statement which checks if a certain condition is true. If it is, then the first part happens. If not, then the second part happens. The easiest condition to check is if something is true or false. These are often called flags in the sense that a flag can either be up, so true, or down, so false, and can be easily checked. To show this, we will first create this simple menu with two choices. The first choice, up, sets the variable my flag to true. What does that mean? Let's say that a variable is a specific parameter in our program. Without stating it before, that variable does not even exist. You cannot ask for it later if it's not even mentioned before. In our case, we are setting the my flag variable to true with the first choice and false in the second choice using the equal sign. Remember, this is very important. One equal sign means that you are assigning a value to a variable. The dollar sign in the beginning is to let RenP know that the, what follows is going to be Python code and not its own scripting language so it doesn't get confused. And also you should remember to write true or false with capital T and F because that's very important for Python. 
After the menu, you can check the if conditions, the my flag and the colon checks that if this condition is true, and then it will show us that we chose up. Otherwise, if this is not true and it is false, it will do the else. We can see it happening right here. If we choose up, it will show us that we chose up. Going back, if we chose down, it will show us that we chose down. This is a very simplified version in the, using an if condition. But what if we want to check something more complicated than true or false? In this case, we can assign another value to a variable such as a number or even text. Let's have a menu with four choices, 1999, 2023, 2019, and 2257. Each choice will set the variable year to a specific number. In this case, exactly what we're going in this text as an option. Now, it will give us these options, and if we choose 2019, it will show us a very specific text. It will do this by going here and checking if the year variable is equal to 1999. When we want to check if something is equal, we put two equal signs, because otherwise if we put one equal sign, then it's assigning a value to a variable. And we really don't want to do that in the middle of an if which is checking the variable. So depending on the choice we made, the number goes to the variable, and depending on the number, it gives us the appropriate text. It does this by using if, and then again, else if. This is what elif means. If it does not have any of these choices, then it goes down to the else. But you should not be able to see this, because there are four choices, each one gives a number, and we check with all four. You can even decide that you don't need an else in this case, but it's always a good idea to have it in case you go and catch an error. We have mentioned it before. It's really important for the computer's understanding where a line starts and how many spaces there are. The first thing to know is that in a program, each line is an independent thing. There is no page and the line doesn't break at the end, it can keep going and going. That way each line has a unique number from line 1 onwards that you can use it to isolate what went wrong or to show someone, hey, check these codes in lines 42 to 44. Also really important is the indentation, which comes in multiples of four spaces. So no space at all means that it's like the base of the program and it's reserved for things like labels, menus and in the beginning to define things like characters. To signify that something is inside another thing, so a dialogue is inside a label or choices are inside a menu, we are using the four spaces indentation. So the computer understands in this case that this text is inside this label and this choice is inside this menu. And inside the choices, another four spaces and this is what happens if we make this choice, so that it is not confused with what happens if we make this choice. Think of it as boxes within boxes, or even the folder structure in a computer. That's how neat a computer wants things to be, otherwise it gets really confused. And I mean it, even one space less at some point, or putting 8 spaces instead of 4, really creates a problem in the program. Let's put this for example an extra 4 spaces. We are saving it, and we are trying to launch the project. And we get this exactly here, at line 30. It says us exactly what the problem is. So, this is pretty much what a block is. A group of lines with the same indentation. This means that if the indentation changes to more spaces, then a new block is created. So in the menu, this is one block that belongs to this block that belongs to this block. But when the next line has less indentation, like this, that block is closed and you return to the original one. Try to think of them as our favorite plastic building bricks and maybe it will be a little easier, but the folder analogy also works. In the meantime, remember, four spaces, or you can use the tab button, in most editors it automatically makes four spaces, otherwise your program won't run.
statements in Renpy are pretty much what you're asking the program to do. A label statement is one that begins with label and you tell Renpy that whatever follows under it belongs to that particular label. While a say statement is one that prompts Renpy to have a character or the narrator speak whatever you write after it. Statements usually have certain common elements. The most common is the keyword used to introduce that statement. Label statements need the label keyword, show statements need the show keyword, etc. The only exception is the say statement, which either starts directly with quotes, if we want the narrator to speak, with the name of the character speaking in quotes, and then what we want them to say in quotes, or the keyword that we have defined is the name of the character, and then what we want them to say again in quotes. The reason that this is happening, of course, as an exception is because the say statement is by far the most common to be used in RenP, since after all these are games based on text and dialogue. Another common element is the name of a statement, because for statements like labels, we need unique names for each one. On the other hand, menus or conditional statements don't really need a specific name of their own. A third element we have seen so far is image names, which are a bunch of words separated by spaces. The first word is the tag, while the rest are image attributes. So, for example, if for while logo small is the image tag and small is the attribute. It can be as complex as so if for while logo small reverse left to right, which we're not using right now, but you can understand that it shows a different image every time. Another even more common element is a string. In programming, a string is a specific bunch of text. For now, the important part to remember is that a string needs to begin with a quote and it needs to end with a quote, otherwise Rempy can get very confused. We'll talk about strings more in the next video. Part of many statements are also Python expressions, so like bits of Python code inside of Rempy statements. The most common ones you will find are integers, which means whole numbers like 3 or 5, Floats, so numbers with decimal points like 5.4 or even 3.0. Strings, that we talked about a little bit before. And true and false, which must begin with a capital letter. And a lot more, like tuples and lists and more programming stuff we don't have to worry about now. One extra thing we might need to know about is something called a function. A function is literally a set of commands we have already established and usually they also take extra information when used called parameters. In the beginning, for example, when we define the e4y, we are actually calling the character function, which starts and ends with the brackets, which are a very important part of functions. And inside we have parameters. We definitely in the name of the character, so this is not optional, but the color that will show us the name is actually optional. As is to be expected from a text game, one of the most important aspects is text itself. The first thing we will talk about is strings, which is the programming way to say a bunch of text. And strings are made up of characters. Each single letter or symbol or even the space is called a character. So this is a character, this is a character, the space is a character, full stop is a character. A string is contained between quotes. The first quote tells Rempy what follows is part of the string. Then, the unquote tells Rempy that this is where it ends. Quotes are not actually part of the string and they would not show up. Which brings us to a common problem, as people often put quotes inside strings and then Rempy gets really confused. If you put, quote, hello there, unquote, human, quote, how are you, unquote, this is not one single string that says hello there, human, how are you, it is two different strings with the word human inside, which probably Rempy will not understand at all. And then this will make a mess and probably you will get the gray screen again. So how do you handle that? The same way that quotes mean something specific, there is another character that means something specific. It's the backslash. If you type the backslash character, whatever other character follows will always show up as that specific character, losing its special status. So backslash quote, shows up as a simple quote. And once you do it with both, then suddenly this is one single string that will show up the quotes inside the text. And now Rempy is no longer confused. 
Backslash is also used for some special stuff too. Like backslash n literally means to start a new line, or backslash backslash means you will have an actual backslash in the text if that's what you need. That's why backslash is called an escape character and backslash plus another character is called an escape sequence. Another interesting trick is using square brackets called interpolating data. The fancy name means, for example, that if you put the name of a variable in the square brackets, then it will show up in the text. So if we chose 2019, for example, then this will show up because of this. If, on the other hand, we just wanted the square bracket, then we just put it twice, so it will show us one in the text. But what do we want a bit more fancy text, like bold or italics? Well, we are going to use text tags. Text tags work by enclosing the part of the text you want to make bold or italics, putting a B or I within curly or angly brackets, where you want the bold or italics text to start, and a slash B or slash I to signify its end, again within curly brackets where it wants to end, as you can see here. This tells Rempy exactly which part you want to make bold or italics, but you should be very careful not to alternate them. Close one first before opening the others. As you can see, if it's not closed, they cannot be combined. There is also the capability for NP to have text for the same game translated in different languages, but that's a really advanced feature that's important to mention, but obviously beyond the scope of these videos. Now on to something a little bit more advanced. As you have seen from the game so far, there is a very specific way that the things shown, the displayables, appear. The text, the images, etc. This is called a style and there is obviously a default style. But the good news is you can alter it as you see fit. All it takes is to know exactly what you want and then find out how to do it. So now we will see some basic information about styles. There's a lot more to it and you can do a lot of customization if you put in the effort. First, let's talk about the style inspector. This is a useful tool when testing out your game. You press Shift and I and it opens this nifty grey window that you can check the kind of styles there are. So if we press it here, we can see there's only two. The screen Say, which is what shows the dialog, and the screen Quick Menu for the options we see below. Back, Save, Load, etc. But if we move on and we press it on the menu, then we see it has the screen Choice instead of Say, because it's showing a different kind of style for the choices that appear in front of us. If we actually hover over one of them and highlight it, it turns orange and if we press shift i again, we can see that it actually has different styles. As a matter of fact, it's defining the V-Box and the button styles. Why? Because there is something for styles called inheritance. Like a family tree, a style can have parents and children. Any property we don't define on a style, it takes from its parents automatically. So in this case, it is taking all the parameters from the style called screen choice, but then it changes the color so that we can actually see that it's highlighted. What we can do, as a very simple example, is go in the beginning, this is very important where we define it, and use the keyword style, define my text, and use is to say what is the parent. So anything that we don't define for my text, it will take automatically from its parent text. What we want is we want it to be really big, size 100, and be green. So we say color and we put the HTML code for green. So now we can see that the text that will appear shows like this, big and green. So what happens if we do not define this style? If we go down and see the code here, we are defining that the text yes has the style my text. But if we put no style or no, then it will turn up like this. Not very interesting actually. By the way, this is a very interesting way to create text and make it look like an image and behave like one using the text function and giving it the text parameter and if we want our style. You might want to check it out. So, you can change the style for any displayables, including images, text, menus, anything you decide, offering you the chance to customize your game's appearance and make it truly your own.
So now we have our little game ready to play. But we need to open it every time through NP editing software to launch the project. That's not how games should be. Not to mention that this way all your code is plain for all to see and maybe you don't want that at all. Once you have finished your game, it's time to build it. Building means that the code is changed into an actual program on its own so you don't need to open it through NP. And then you can send it to anyone just like any other game or program they are using. To build it, you will need to go in the main launcher window to Actions and then find Build Distributions. A distribution is the fancy name given to the program made. You will see a number of options. The one you actually need to choose is what you decide depending on the platform you want it to play. You'll be happy to know that RMP can play on Windows, Linux and Mac. You just need to give each one the right distribution. For our example, we will choose PC, Windows and Linux, Macintosh and Linux, so you can see the difference. The reason we don't put Windows is that sometimes the builds are not compatible with all versions, so just put the PC to be sure. Then click on Build and wait. This will take a while. Once it is done, it will automatically open the folder. Conveniently, all three files have the name, the version of the game, if you want to create later versions, you can give them different names, etc. And what it's supposed to work on. We will unzip the PC version and open the folder. It has all the necessary folders we need for the game and a very convenient .exe file that we can run. Double click and it opens and you can play. So now you can send your friends or upload on the internet any of the appropriate versions and they can play and have fun. Thank you for watching these videos.